So today my session will be about uh, cell architecture. So it's uh, like Asanka said, it's a continuation of uh, the high-level concepts that uh, Asanka spoke about in his session. Uh, so we will uh, look at uh, some of the implementation details on how we can uh, like uh, work on a reference implementation uh, of the cell architecture, right? So. Uh, so we'll like look at how we can uh, implement this in practice. So this is actually related to a research project that uh, some of us are working on. So it's in uh, very, very early research. So um, uh, it's going to be like, so like the implementation is going to be based on uh, Kubernetes, Istio, and so on. So during the rest of the presentation, we will look at uh, these details. So just to recap, uh, about from this, this slide is from Asanka's presentation. Uh, so uh, what is a cell? Right? Um, so in a, in a microservices architecture, you can have like several microservices. Uh, so let's say these microservices now like uh, interact with each other. Uh, so if you do not have a proper model of uh, you know, wiring these microservices together, eventually you will end up uh, with a spaghetti mess, right? Uh, so what we are trying to do is, uh, uh, we are trying to define a mechanism through which we can define a grouping of uh, such services, components, logically group them, and then have some level of control over who can access whom, right? So imposing certain boundaries. So right, for example, within a cell, you could have different security policies, like services could talk to each other. But across cells, you have different security policies. So we'll uh, look at that uh, during the rest of the presentation. Uh, so uh, I need to talk about a bit about uh, service mesh architecture before I go into uh, more details. Uh, so um, rather than, uh, like, uh, uh, so rather than uh, getting microservices, your actual service implementation to directly talk to another service, uh, what service meshes allow is uh, for you for, for, as a developer to concentrate on your business logic. And then there is this infrastructure level component or infrastructure level uh, service that basically provides the wiring between uh, the, the different services. So uh, your calls, so let's say your service now makes a call out to a different service. Uh, these calls can be transparently intercepted and then you could enforce certain policies, routing rules and all this stuff using a service mesh architecture. Uh, so a service mesh, uh, uh, the interesting thing here is like a, a service mesh has uh, two concepts, a data plane and a control plane. So the routing takes place uh, through the data plane. So as you can see here, uh, these are the end user services. So this service may be written in uh, uh, Spring Boot, this service might be written in uh, Node.js, so the services, as a service author, I will not actually think about, like, uh, worry about uh, the discovery aspects, uh, the, uh, the resiliency and stuff like that as a service author. So I just make a call out to uh, this service. So these are, like, uh, um, uh, my example is specific to Kubernetes. So these are running in two different pods. Uh, so uh, in this architecture, there will be a, a sidecar proxy. So within the pod, there is another container that, uh, that is a, a transparent proxy that is running, which will intercept your calls. It will uh, enforce, you can enforce certain policies here. You can have like observability, all those stuff you can basically have at this level. So as a developer, you don't actually worry about those things. Uh, and then uh, with the control plane, what you can do is you can like enforce certain routing policies. So the controlling of how the routing takes place, right? So uh, maybe the, the DNS mapping, the routing rules, um, some sort of like throttling. So if you want to like uh, uh, say that uh, this particular service is accessible only by uh, two other services, you could enforce such policies using the control plane. So the control plane is used to uh, control the data plane. So that's a very high level uh, summary. Uh, so when it comes to uh, cell-based reference architecture, uh, a cell is a self-contained unit. So it could, it's, a, it's a, a grouping of uh, uh, certain stuff that are related, right? So a, a set of related components. So these components can be microservices. They could be like, they could have like gateways. You could have your, uh, you know, 
uh, other data sources. So all these things are grouped together. So as you can see, even at the cell level, uh, we have a concept of a control plane and a data plane, right? And uh, each of these cells is a single deployment unit, right? So uh, yeah, uh, the cell groups together a bunch of components, but these uh, components or the cell is deployed as a single unit. So you can deploy it as a single unit. You could version it separately. Uh, the elasticity of uh, uh, the cells can be con controlled through different policies and so on, right? So let's look at uh, some more details uh, of uh, this implementation architecture. Uh, so uh, in our research project, uh, what we have done is we are using uh, Istio, which is the most uh, popular service mesh out there. So I don't want to uh, go into more details. So what we are doing is actually building on top of uh, Istio. So uh, the service mesh architecture itself like, gives us uh, most of the functionality that we need. Uh, so what we are doing is we are like uh, implementing a service mesh plus plus with uh, different uh, cell boundaries, security policies, observability stuff. So we'll look at uh, that stuff in more details. Um, and we also use this uh, project called uh, K-Native. So it's a bit of a new uh, project out there. So that uh, allows you to deploy components in like serverless components, functions as a service, and so on. Uh, so K-Native, again, uh, uh, is like uh, runs on Kubernetes, and it's uh, tightly coupled with uh, uh, Istio. Uh, so if you want, uh, even so, if you have components which are serverless components or functions as a service uh, in your cell, Knative uh, is uh, the, the, the technology that we use to build that. Uh, so Knative also has another component called Kaniko that allows you to like uh, just provide a Git repo. So for example, let's say within your cell, uh, you, you basically provide the Git URL of your cell. Right? So now this is related to CI, CD. Uh, so when you push your changes to your Git repo, what uh, this component can do is it could pick it up, build it, and then like run your integration tests and so on, and then push it in, right? So and you can have like blue-green deployment, canary deployment, and so on. So these are some of the uh, building blocks that uh, we uh, are using. So uh, looking at an overall high-level architecture, so. Um, so here you can see uh, at the global level, we have a global data plane. So this basically uh, is the layer through which uh, the external traffic reaches into your system. So this is our system that is running on Kubernetes. Uh, we have a global control plane and a global data plane. And these are the cells that are running within the system. So edge security is implemented at this API gateway level. right? So uh, so that, uh, the, the calls can come in through different systems. You know, and, uh, the API calls could come through you know, Android uh, mobile apps, or you know, uh, could come through web apps and so on. Uh, so the edge security is implemented at this level. And then uh, you know, the, the request is passed through into the, it's routed into the relevant uh, cell. So uh, the next slide talks about how uh, the cell uh, deployment or the architecture inside the cell looks like. So these are uh, these are cell. Uh, so you have a particular pod. So your cell can have one or more pod, uh, and then like uh, the the ingress into the cell is through the cell gateway. So this is again I'm just expanding on this bit of the diagram, right? So you have the cell gateway which controls the ingress. So what you can do is here we can have policies which say. Uh, okay, I, I expect uh, this kind of you know uh, tokens in order to let the call through into my cell. So uh, what happens is like a, a service which is running in a different cell cannot directly come into this cell. It cannot directly contact this cell because we have enforced the security policies. Uh, so it can only enter through the cell gateway at which point the security validation happens and then the call is let through. So then uh, within uh, the pod, uh, this is the service mesh proxy. So uh, in Istio, the default proxy is uh, Envoy. 
so then the proxy at the proxy level also you can uh, enforce certain rules you can have uh, observability and then the call goes into the service and then uh, your service also might want to make calls outside the cell right so now this service may want to call another service which is running inside the cell or it might want to call another uh, cell an api in another cell or it might want to make a call totally outside so you say you want to call salesforce.com so these are some of the scenarios that we will look at in the rest of the uh, presentation so we are calling this a service mesh mesh plus plus because uh, in addition to uh, the service mesh uh, what we have is we have built in api management we have uh, security observability and so on so the thing uh, that uh, is interesting here is as a developer uh, when you have this particular runtime you are you are a cell developer uh, what happens is uh, all of these facilities become available automatically right uh, so a cell can contain uh, one of several things right so a cell can contain uh, services a cell can contain apis so at a cell level you can describe what apis are exposed to the outside world and a cell can also describe what apis are exposed at the global gateway level right remember there is a global data plane right so and then we have the cell level data plane so there are apis at different levels so a cell can describe what apis are going to be uh, exposed so this is a kubernetes uh, yaml file so which is a cell description so the interesting thing is uh, we have a kind called cell right so by de by default kubernetes uh, doesn't have this kind of resource so this is a custom resource uh, so i'll talk about that so we ha have uh, once we uh, like uh, install this custom resource definition so we have written some kubernetes custom resource definitions uh, so once you install those on a vanilla kubernetes cluster uh, the, the concept of a cell becomes a first class concept right and then uh, we have the different templates we are you know these are the apis cell level apis so we have a context call info which is uh, uh, exposed as uh, a cell level api so through the uh, info context you can you can actually get into the gateway right so we can Uh, so the cell descriptor describes that so in addition to that the service template is specifying what are the services that are in, uh, that are included within the cell right so we have like a sample app hr right so this is a service that we are declaring so this is just a docker image and then you know this those of you who are familiar with kubernetes will be will be already familiar with uh, this kind of spec so you can specify the replica count so if you specify the replica count as zero that's where k native or the serverless stuff kicks in right so unless a request comes in uh, you will not have instances of this particular container running in right so you can have the replicas so the scalability is handled through that uh, and you could have other environment variables and so on so these are the standard uh, kubernetes stuff that uh, those of you who are, have worked with kubernetes should be familiar with uh so uh so a custom resource in kubernetes is a way of like uh, extending the kubernetes api so for, for example in kubernetes you can say kub cutl like right? uh, kub ctl get pods right so uh, pods are a resource right so it will uh, give you all the pods that are running within that particular kubernetes cluster right so similarly uh, in order to make this work uh the cell to make the cell architecture work we have written a number of custom resources so like cells gateways and there are like these services are uh, like um, uh, cell level uh, services uh, so these are some of the custom crd so when when you install these custom resource definitions on top of a uh, vanilla kubernetes installation what happens is like you uh, get the ability to uh, treat cells as first class uh resources right so then kub ctl get cells will basically give you the cells that are running in the system and it will basically give you a drill down of what's happening within the cell so it will give the status of the cell so if a cell contains multiple services and then like one of the services is not deployed it, uh, the cell will not will be in the not ready status right so these are some of the uh, facilities provided by the custom resource definitions 
So uh, uh, the most uh, interesting aspect, in my opinion, is uh, implementing the security boundaries. So let's talk about a bit about that. Uh, so like uh, before I go into details, I would like to take a simple example and then try to explain it to you because uh, that makes it easier to understand uh, uh, this domain. Uh, so what we have is like we have a, a deployment with three cells, right? So these are three independent cells. So we have an HR cell, stock cell, and employee cell. Uh, and then what we are trying to build is we are trying to build an application which will basically uh, like uh, list out some employee details. So if you like uh, provide the employee ID, so once the employee logs into this particular app, uh, what happens is uh, uh, through this app, you can basically get, a, uh, get the HR details, the employee's uh, details, salary details, uh, the stock options and stuff like that, right? So uh, in order to get all that data, these different cells have to interact with each other. So, uh, so we have uh, uh, the first cell, which is called the HR cell. Uh, so here you can see uh, the call. There is a call that goes out to HR cell, makes a call uh, out to two other cells. Uh, so within uh, the employee cell, there is a service-to-service -service direct interaction. Uh, so here we have an uh, interaction that, goes, uh, that happens between uh, two cells. So uh, now let's break down this scenario into these different parts, and then like we'll understand uh, how things work, right? So first we have, we have to talk about edge security. So edge security is at the global data plane, right? It, it deals with how the user will auth authenticate with the global gateway. Uh, and then like the, the, so this is where yeah, your mobile app your, or your web app is authenticating and getting and presenting an access token. So uh, you can, you can authenticate and present uh, maybe an OAuth2 access token or assign JWT, uh, and you can enforce authentication policies and so on at this level. Right? So this is the first part of that particular deployment. So we have the data plane. So we are talking about uh, this aspect. So uh, the first step is uh, the user authenticates with an access token, and uh, the call comes in. Uh, and at the global gateway level, what happens is this call is forwarded to the API manager, uh, which basically uh, authenticates and does the policy enforcement. And uh, if that step succeeds, it will return a signed JWT with the uh, audience set as HR. So audience is a claim uh, in the JWT. So uh, it will uh, set the audience as HR because the call is the initial call is going to the HR cell. So it's mainly uh, using this audience. Uh, so audience is basically it defines the uh, uh, the server roles that uh, have to accept that particular token. So uh, so in order for this cell to accept this particular token, the proper audience has to be set. So if the audience is HR it will let this call go through. If the audience is not HR, it will simply get rejected at this level, right? So the sign JWT is now uh, forwarded. So the request along with the sign JWT and uh, audience is forwarded to the HR gateway. So that's basically edge security, right? So from the edge, now we have reached into the cell. So the next step is the security inside the cell. So uh, so the cell gateway is going to be the single access point. Uh, so de like I said, uh, you are using the audience direct access like from microservice outside the cell are uh, uh, prevented. Uh, so then uh, there is a, uh, in the cell control plane, we have a cell STS, uh, which uh, validates the JWT based on trust. And then it enforces authorization-based uh, policies, uh, and it uh, basically passes user context information. So let's look at this diagram. Uh, so now the call with the sign JWT and audience is reaching into uh, the cell gateway, right? At which point now uh, the call goes into the particular pod. So this is the pod. So if you can remember uh, about the service mesh concepts that I spoke about, when a call comes in, it is uh, intercepted by the proxy. So the proxy at that point, uh, through a webhook, what it does is it calls out to an STS, a security token service, which is running in the cell control plane. right? 
So the call goes out to validate the JWT, right? Uh, so this particular uh, STS will validate the JWT. It will, uh, you know, enforce policies and extract uh, user information, right? Uh, so only if this step uh, succeeds, the call will go through. Otherwise, the call will uh, fail. So what happens is the JWT already contains certain claims, right? So uh, in order to uh, make life easier for the service author, so as a service author, you will be mainly like you will be writing this, and then you will be writing the cell definition, right? So all of these stuff are injected by the cell runtime, right? Uh, so what happens is to make life easier for you, from the JWT, the use, uh, uh, information that they are in the user context uh, in the JWT is extracted and passed as headers, right? So when you when the call comes in here, you will basically get uh, all the headers. So you can simply call, extract those headers and read the relevant information in your app. So that's just a uh, step to make life easy for service authors. So now we have talked about. Uh, cell level security, so that's security of an incoming call into the cell. So next, let's look at, look at uh, how uh, security works within a cell. Now, uh, this is the scenario where one service within a cell is calling another service, right? So how do we uh, enforce uh, security there, right? So this deals with uh, microservice communication within a cell. Uh, so service to service communication is secured with uh, mutual TLS. So that's how we implement that. Uh, again, authentication and user context is done via signed JWT issue, issued by uh, that cell's STS. So let's look at that, right? So now the uh, call has come in. Now in this scenario, what we are trying to do is this particular employee service is trying to make a call to the salary service, right? So this is what we want to do. So as a service author, you have written some logic to call the salary service. So what happens is the call is intercepted by the service mesh proxy. Uh, now the service mesh proxy, like I mentioned earlier, it's the same architecture. It calls out to the cell STS, control plane STS, which will, uh, so it has received a signed JWT with the audience as employee, right? So employee is the uh, cell name, right? So the audience is set as uh, employee. Uh, so now what will happen is, uh, the, the STS will validate that. It knows that the call is going to be made to a service within the cell, and it will uh, issue a signed JWT, which is valid within the particular cell, right? So then the call goes through. Again, it's intercepted by the proxy in the service mesh. Again, there is a validation step, and uh, it will return the user context. So this is similar to uh, the cell boundary security. So the architecture is very symmetrical, right? And then the call goes through. So uh, that's how uh, security works within a cell. So now we have to go to the next step, right? So we have spoken about edge security, security at the cell gateway level, and security within a cell. Now a cell wants to invoke a different cell, right? So this is the next, next aspect that we are going to cover. Uh, so intercell communication deals with uh, communication between uh, two cells. Uh, so like we uh, mentioned earlier, the only entry point is through a cell gateway. You can't directly call uh, the service, right? Because uh, you can't directly call the service because it's going to be intercepted by the service mesh proxy, which will try to do the token validation. And at that point, it will figure out, okay, you don't have a valid token, the call will get rejected, right? Uh, so here, this uh, the intercell communication is based on so each cell has its own security token service, right? So uh, the requirement here is there should be a trust relationship between these two cell STSs, right? So uh, if provided that there is a trust one the 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 STS in one cell trusts the STS in the other cell, intercell communication can work, right? If the trust Relationship is not there. This is not going to work. So this is similar to uh, you know uh, uh, the STS federation and so on. So um, so this diagram 
uh, is looking at uh, that step, so pay attention to this red line. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to make a call from this particular HR service to this particular stock service. So I'm trying to make this call, right? So uh, as a service author, I will be, uh, use the proper uh, URL, uh, and I will make this call. Uh, so I have already um, received a, a JWT with audience set as employee. Uh, so now uh, what happens is, uh, this diagram. So this arrow should be in the other direction. So this, this, this correction has to be there. So the HR app is trying to call uh, uh, the envoy proxy. So what will happen is it will try to uh, obtain a token. So there is a trust relationship between uh, these two uh, STSs. Uh, and then uh, what will happen is it will uh, basically, uh, so there's another error here. This audience should be stocks, right? So uh, it will. Uh, uh, it will issue a token on behalf of this particular STS because of the trust relationship. And uh, along with uh, that particular uh, audience, this call is sent to the stocks gateway, right? So uh, what happens is at the gateway, again, it's uh, similar to what we've discussed so far. Uh, you get the token, and then uh, this STS, the stock uh, cell uh, STS, will validate that particular JWT, and if it's valid, it will let the call go through, right? So the important uh, thing to keep in mind here is the trust relationship between the STSs. So be because of that, uh, this interaction can take place. Uh, so the, just for completeness sake, I have uh, uh, included the next case as well. What if your service wants to make a call to some external API, right? So this is very obvious. Uh, let's say you want to talk to the Salesforce API and so on. So you need to provide the proper credentials at that part. So then uh, it's actually out of the scope of the cell runtime. So it's, uh, that has to be uh, you know, implemented by the developer who is making the actual call. So uh, finally, uh, I would like to talk about analytics and observability. Uh, so as you can see, there are so many moving parts in this architecture, right? So now you, your things could fail at different places. Uh, you, you should be able to trace how your calls are going through. You should be able to see uh, metrics at different levels. So how can we implement that with a cell architecture? So let's look at that. Um, so. Um, this diagram may look a bit complicated, but you need to, need to just pay attention to these blue boxes. Uh, so what we have is we have uh, the observability uh, you know, dashboards and the observability engine, which is uh, running in the global control plane. Uh, and there are agents that are running at each level. So you, can, you have to like, uh, mo monitor the calls. So let's say there is a call coming through this. So like it goes through different layers, right? It goes through the API gateway, it goes through the cell gateway, it goes through a proxy, then it reaches the service, then you might make a call out, then it goes through a different cell gateway. So like there are several, several steps. So there are agents that are running at each step, which uh, basically will uh, record uh, each of these hops, and then it will, these agents will asynchrony, asynchronously publish the observability rules to the central uh, you know, uh, the observability engine, right? So this can be like WSO2 stream processor and so on. Uh, so um, what happens is like, uh, again, through the control plane, so here the, the other interesting aspect is there is a, uh, uh, in the cell control plane, you have an observability uh, uh, runtime as well. So uh, from centrally, you can control how uh, the observability uh, has to behave, right? So example, is you may want to train, uh, uh, turn on tracing just for this particular cell. So you might uh, figure out there is some issue. You want to uh, turn on additional metrics, right? You want to, or you may want to turn on tracing. So through the central control plane, you can control that aspects, and the agents will actually pull 
uh, that configuration, and based on these configuration changes, they will publish uh, new data, right? Or they might just turn off publishing some of or collecting some of the metrics. Uh, so uh, what happens is at each yeah, at each level, uh, these metrics will be uh, published to the observability engine, and then like, uh, you can have a central dashboard which will show you the tracers and so on. <coughs> so the data collection can be at like uh, different levels. So there are different parts uh, in this architecture. So you have a global gateway, identity server, cell gateway, and so on. Uh, and then like uh, uh, the other as important aspect is uh, collecting logs. So you can have like multiple pods running in your system, and like you generate logs. So you should be able to uh, collect logs so that can be uh, done through this infrastructure. Uh, and then like there could be like uh, different uh, data that you want to collect. You want to collect tracing data. You want to collect uh, some metrics about, uh, you know, system metrics like CPU you know, usage, network usage, memory, uh, some cell-based uh, metrics, for example, how long uh, uh, each call took within a particular cell. Right, so uh, then uh, dependency model, so like which cells are calling which other cells, so you can build that model based on the calls that are going through and so on. Right, so these are some of the aspects that are provided by uh, the observability aspect of the control plane. So then, like based on that, you could do like different kinds of alerting. Right, so this is uh, so these bits are also an important aspect of. Uh, a cell-based runtime implementation. So the developer experience, again, I'll talk a bit about this. So Tyler mentioned something about uh, Celery. So that's another research project that we are working on. So as a developer, uh, you should be able to declare a cell. So you need some sort of declaration, right? So uh, basically, this project uh, deals with how to declare a cell, right? So once you declare a cell as a developer, now you should be able to build that. You should be able to deploy that. You should be able to push this to a central registry. Somebody else can discover and use this. So all these aspects uh, come into play, right? So uh, uh, so as a developer, what you have is like you will use uh, the language that you or technology that you are familiar with. You will build your business logic, uh, package it into a cell, and then like you will use. Uh, this cell descriptor to describe the cell, and then you will, you will go through these different steps. And even the CI/CD system will basically like uh, take over. So if you like push a cell, or if you like push the code into a particular Git repo. So I spoke about uh, how Kaniko basically allows you to, uh, you know, build uh, code and run them on the fly. Uh, so all these aspects can be uh, covered. So this is part of the developer experience. So that's it. Uh, my time's up. Um, so do we have time for questions? I have a question about uh, deploying. In the microservice architecture, you're going to deploy each microservice independently. Do I understand it correct that you're actually going to deploy a cell as a whole, or a whole entity? So if we have a couple of microservices, we are going to repackage them into a cell and just deploy the cell and not uh, single microservices. Is that correct, my understanding? Um, yes. So there are like uh, two aspects. So. Um, one aspect is you look at the cell as something that is immutable, right? So the cell as a whole is immutable. If any part changes, even like a configuration that is related to the cell, you have to reversion that and then like push that into, you know, it has to go through the CI CD uh, cycle. Uh, the other aspect is like in developer mode, that could be annoying, right? So now you are developing a cell, but you need to just make some changes to your services. You just want to change a single service and like you don't want to you know, go through the whole deployment process. So uh, I think like in developer mode, we will allow that. So you could change aspects of your service and then just, you know, rewire that, that uh, the new ser service into the cell. But uh, when it comes to like uh, proper like production deployment, you would have to like the cell will have to be treated as an immutable entity. And then like you have to properly version it. 
so that would be the best practice. Okay, so basically we are going to create some bigger monolithic um, packages. Um, Very before, we're fine-grained with the microservice. We have now um, a cell which is bigger and is, is actually more monolithic. The th thing is like uh, the microservice itself can be independently developed and tested and so on. But like if you want this to work within this particular ecosystem, so that's where the cell architecture is going to help you. Okay, thank you.